We welcome you to tonight's uh, program. The uh, executive board of your society, the Bristol Historical Society, starts somewhere way back in January planning for the programs for the summer. And uh, often we bring in an outside speaker, but uh, for the last couple of years we've been talking about uh, at least one meeting a year being done by in-house people. So this year, this program tonight is going to be done by three people. And uh, as you can see there, uh, I'm starting out, and it's on the O'Neill uh, family. I'm the uh, secretary of the society, and when uh, inquiries about genealogy come, uh, Gerald or Sylvia or Steve uh, will send them on to me. I'm sort of unofficially the uh, genealogist. And then uh, the second part of our program, Reg is going to deal with O'Neill properties. And if you know anything about Reg, you know that he is the researcher par excellence for uh, uh, the Bristol Society. And uh, he has a lot of things that he's going to share with us. And you need to hold some questions for that part, unless you have some for the dry <laughs> genealogy that I'm going to suggest. Uh, and then uh, there's going to be a personal touch at the third section with Sylvia talking about the O'Neill farm, which she and Lester bought 1962, was it? 63. Yeah. But you lived there before you bought it. Oh, yes. Yeah. For several years. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know if you know too much about the O'Neills. We're going to hope that when you leave tonight, you'll know a little more about this family. How many of you can guess when they came to this country? What do you know about the potato famine? Oh, yes. 18, 18, you think it was because of the potato famine? I, I would openly say the 1830s or so, but uh, that's just not knowing anything. It's truly a uh, Well, the potato famine in Ireland was 1845 to 1852 or the Great Famine, as they call it. And uh, it's hard to imagine, but a million people in Ireland died because of that famine, and a million people emigrated, uh, mostly to uh, America. The population in Ireland fell 20 to 25 percent during, during those years. Now, the O'Neills, however, came before the potato famine. I have done some research. Well, I really started doing genealogy because of my mother's family in Moncton, the Dean family, and then my wife's family from Starsborough. And I did those two towns, and then I gradually got involved with Bristol genealogy. But up in Little Ireland, if you know where that is, um, near Hills Hillsborough in Starsborough, um, I found on the various censuses in the 1800s, over 30 Irish names that came and went during that period. It's just amazing. Uh, Gerald can tell you about his family living up on a hard scrabble farm uh, up there in uh, Little Ireland. Well, the O'Neills in Ireland probably were a whole different class of people than those that came and settled in Little Ireland in Starksboro. Uh, let's have the, uh, you've got it already. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, if, we, if we didn't have the lights on, you'd see that the coat of arms is, is a bright red, uh, no, you can't turn the lights off, because you can see it. It's a bright red coat of arms. Uh, if any of you know about heraldry, you know that um, in England, you, you have to be a descendant in order to claim it. And I don't know what we Americans have such a fascination with coats of arms all about. It's, uh, it's rather silly of us. We're supposed to be uh, away from that aristocracy. But uh, there are people that are always uh, wanting to know what is the coat of arms for their family. And it's interesting, there was a lady uh, 
Let me call her uh, Marsha White Sec, S-E-C. And she got uh, a, a solicitation from one of these genealogy mills. They used to originate out in Bath, Ohio. And she got a solicitation. Dear Miss Sec, we have your coat of arms. And if you'd like to order it, uh, we will put it up onto a plaque-like thing. And it was all described. Well, she wasn't Miss Sec at all. She was Miss White. And somehow they had picked up her name, uh, Marsha White, and left out the comma, Sec, meaning secretary. <laughs> so they had created a whole coat of arms for Miss Sec. And they, they created it and tried to palm this off uh, for her interests. So you have to be careful about those uh, advertisements and solicitations. Well, the coat of arms for uh, the O'Neills is genuine, and the Irish coats of arms are not the same as the English coat of arms. In Ireland, if you're a member of the clan or the sept, S-E-P-T, in Ireland, you can advertise or bear the coat of arms. And uh, the O'Neill coat of arms, if you can see, that red hand in the middle, the red hand is almost a symbol for Ireland. And they trace their ancestry back to the kings of Ireland. Uh, and that red hand is explained in several different ways. Uh, when tribes were coming into Ireland, there was a promise that the person that first landed, or who first touched the soil, of Ireland, it would be his. So this O'Neill was rowing along and he was sort of falling behind the others. And so he cut off his hand and threw it to shore. And uh, of course, this is a myth, but he claimed that he was the first to touch the land of Ireland. Uh, there are other uh, myths as well, but this goes way back. And uh, the coat of arms evolved through the years and until it is sort of like that. The fish at the bottom is a salmon and uh, refers to their knowledge, their kingly knowledge or, or, or the uh, kingly origin of the family in Ireland. And uh, I think that's enough about that part. Um, let's, let's go on uh, to the family. The uh, the descendants of these three, Sean, Catherine, and Francis, were children of an unknown O'Neill. And they came from Ireland in 1821. Now, what did I tell you about the uh, potato famine? 1845. So they left Ireland before the potato famine. And they also left Ireland a few years before the Roman Catholic Church was granted permission once again to have representatives in the parliament. Up until 1829, uh, of course they were, uh, you know, they were put down even after that, but up until 1829, uh, they didn't have the right to uh, represent themselves. They, uh, they were controlled by England and only at that point was there some emancipation for the Catholic Church. And, and yet, um, you know, they were 80% of the population of Ireland. And they were controlled, and that was one of the problems during the potato famine. They were controlled by these absentee landlords that lived over in England and sent back through a middleman to collect their rents. And the rents, of course, were the good produce of the land and the uh, Irish farmers were left with the potatoes, and then a blight came along, and they died. The potatoes died, and the people died. Well, in 1821, these three came over, and I, I didn't follow Sean very far. He, he had two sons, John and James, and James had one child, but I didn't ever find out where he went. But the, the third fellow, of this unknown O'Neill, and I didn't, wasn't able to go back. Uh, Francis 
he came through Canada and then down to Highgate, Vermont. And he bought land in Highgate. And guess what that land is today? The Tyler House Resort. If any of you know Franklin County, you know it's quite a, a famous place uh, up there in Franklin County. And he bought that and lived there in Highgate for a number of years, farmed it, but they did not like the taste of the water. If you know about the Tyler House, it was a spa, sulfur springs in Highgate Springs. He didn't like that. And uh, so then, let's go to the next one. He had, oh, I think 11 children. Yes. Patrick had 11 children. And he came to Bristol around 1869. He made a trade with the people that owned what is the bike uh, place, the O'Neill Farm. He made a trade with whoever owned that, I've got it in my minutes, uh, for the land in Highgate. I don't know who was the, had the better deal. Uh, if he had left that in the family, you know, the, the O'Neills would be far better off maybe today than they are. Although, you know, it, there weren't very many of them. I mean, there, he had 11, Patrick did, but look, no children, no children, no children. Dr. James, one child. The others had no children. Either they didn't marry or they were uh, fer infertile or whatever you want to call it. They didn't have children. And uh, these are places where they were born and these are places where they died. Most of the O'Neills are buried over in Mount St. Joseph Cemetery uh, and all in one great big stone with their names on it. Dr. James O'Neill, the son of Patrick, was a doctor and he went to Maine. And now you can go to the next and get Ed here. Edward Lynch O'Neill and he's the one that um, Sylvia will be talking about. Uh, that owned the farm uh, before the coffins bought it. But uh, you see, you know, they had no children. And William Patrick, some of you may have known him, Bill O'Neill. He had two children. His two children were Ellen and Edward. And this is the one we know as Bill here in Bristol. Even though he's named Edward, he went by his middle name. What? Yeah, you bring him down to the next generation. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, that's, uh, that's Bill's son. This is Bill. Oh, I guess. This is Bill and this is Bill. Same man, but you, you're in the sixth generation and then two children. And you bring this one down and this is uh, Ed. I mean, this is Bill. He had, you've got another slide. No, that was it. Oh no, this is, that's the other one. You're right, this is Bill. Yeah. And you bring him down here. Yeah. That's right. And then Ellen, who was a classmate of yours in high school, lived in the house uh, raised by her grandmother Marjorie Hill uh, in the house where we live, and then her brother Ed, and then Ed is the continuation, and he had two children, and I don't know, because I talked with Ellen, wrote with her and exchanged emails and so forth, but she didn't want to go any farther than her father, really. She didn't want me to share all of this with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I could share more, but I won't. <laughs> because I knew her well, and, uh, and her family. But anyway, uh, they sort of died out until you get down to uh, Bill's son, Ed, and uh, he lives out of state. So we don't know uh, too much about them because family wasn't forthcoming to tell me. Um, I think, really, unless you have some questions, that's all of the genealogy you need to know about the O'Neill family. So we will go to... Reg.
To get situated here. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to talk about Patrick, some of Patrick's properties. That was the one that had the 11 children. And apparently he was quite a land baron because if you go into the town records, he was one of the, some of those gentlemen back in the 1900s that were, their name is on, seemed like about every other page of the record books because they were lending money for, and taking mortgages and selling them by it. But he had, uh, his name would show up in many of the, the book, you know, uh, record books. And like I say, besides owning his own land, he held mortgages. And I started with the um, quadrennial records that we have here. And, uh, wrong one. And they started, they go every four years. In 1870, he had showed 414 acres of land. Then 74 was 375. I don't know what happened to him. I think they just counted different. But by 1878, he had two houses and a lot. And one of the houses was the Daniels place that he purchased in 1875. And that was down the east end of Main Street. He had Fires Hotel and Farr's uh, eating salon. But that was that he had that one. And by 1882, he had four more houses and a lot, and just 370 acres. 1886, he had a house, two house lots and a store, and the quarry place. A lot of these places I couldn't find for sure where they were. That wasn't sure. I had a pretty good idea, but I, I not 100% sure. So he had the house a lot and the quarry place, and he purchased that in 1882. Well, the quarry place was right here. It was uh, where Luther and Phyllis Pitkin lived, okay, at, South, at 13 South Street. He owned that one. Um, by 1890, he owned the Branch Place, which was, you might not know it, you might know it as the O'Neill Apartments across the street. This is where the, the St. Ambrose Church is today. Okay? And that was the old Branch Place. And there's another, another view of it. But, uh, you know, it was the O'Neill. And that was there until 1970. And that was torn down to build a church. And that little boy is uh, David J. Bosworth, in case you were wondering. He's the son of William Nichols Bosworth. I think he would be a nephew of Dr. David. Uh, there's two pictures on the bottom. You can see is when they, Mount Liberty took those, when they were tearing it down. Did you say that was? Who? The child? David J. Bosworth. William. Okay. I think it's I think it's Dr. David's nephew. But, uh, the next was uh, Daniel's place, and that's back to the former hotel. That's what it was called by 1890. I don't know where the Herbert place was, and the uh, of course the home farm is. The bicycle touring. And okay, after that was the uh, the, the uh, he had the butler, the block and the lot, the butler place, the quarry place, and Church Street house. Is this he owned this one? That was that was where I lived. Well, that's here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He kind of had a little pattern. He started up through, and okay, after the Church Street house, we had uh, the Crane house. And that's the Crane place, located next to the old fire station. And 
1897, Patrick sold the land to build the new, to the fire district, to build the fire station. So he was involved in that, along with, you know, Daniel's house. Daniel's house is a separate, you had the Daniel's place, and then there was a Daniel's house. And that Daniel's house was located across the road. Daniel's owned the land across from the, the home farm, kind of in that little V between there and Burpee Road. That was Daniel's. So that was a separate one. And uh, one of the houses up there was possibly moved from East Street. Yeah, which, well, East Street, I think it was moved from down near where the O'Neill block ended up at the south end of Main Street, because that's Main Street was East Street then. So it, but I'm not sure where that was moved to. It was, it was he moved a house in 1895 from East Street up onto North Street somewhere. And the Munson place was, that's the old Munson place where, where the, where the dentist is now. So he was, he was investing his money all over. And the, the, blacksmith, the blacksmith shop, I, I'm not sure. I don't know where that was. And he, had, he still had his 315 acres of land. That was between 1898 and 1906. The fire reports, they list fires uh, that at the O'Neill block, his South Street tenant, tenement, which was the quarry place where Pitkins lived, the park tenement, was the Munson place and the tenement north of the Catholic rectory. And so uh, then I found, I found two more that weren't listed um, in, the, in the records because those were every four years. And in 19, he owned these two houses in the alley, what they call the alley, the one north of the rectory and the one beside it because in 1905 he deeded the first one to his daughter Margaret, and he, at the same time he deeded the other one to his daughter uh, Teresa. So right now he owns from here right straight up through to Church Street, and he had another house on the north side of Church Street, and I'm not exactly sure where that one was, so. Those are that, that I uh, know about, and then, these are some of his. These are some of his kids, his heirs: John, James, Frank, Willie, Nellie, and Margaret. Yeah. So, by uh, in 1914, it, it was listed. The O'Neill estate consisted of yeah, six, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of his eleven children, having owning all the property, because he had deeded it over and he had died by 1914, but if you look, some of them owned a third of it, of a house, some owned a six, like the Main Street block, some of them owned some land, some of them owned half of a house, so <laughs> it had to have gotten a little bit confusing, you know? I think there might have been a little tension there. That may be why they don't have any money. I think they sold everything, but they had, and, it was kind of neat. I don't know what happened to Teresa's house and Margaret said he deeded to him because they don't show up there now. So. But like I say, if you get into his, he was doing a lot of wheeling and dealing. Uh, the the O'Neill block was, was uh, on Main Street, was probably the largest piece of property that he owned. Um, it was, it was located where Sam's gas station later stood. And, and then it was when Sam's was, was raised in 2002 to, make, to build the National Bank of Middlebury. See, the origin of the O'Neill Block. It, about, it was erected about 1830 as a hotel known as Fars Hotel. There's that one again. And and then at some point, uh, well, it basically, the O'Neill block basically started with those two buildings, the, the saloon and the, 
the eating saloon and the hotel. Uh, after it was, then it was, uh, Daniels owned it for a while. Daniels sold it to Hot James Hopkins. Hawkins in 1873 exchanged it for the farm of Charles Abernathy in the Haven. In 1875 it was known as Abernathy's Hotel and then Abernathy sold it to Patrick in 1875 and by that time it was known as Daniel's Place in the town records. It was located, well roughly, yeah. Turned it off, didn't you? Yeah, it was around right in here. Okay, because this was the old. And now. Uh, yeah, Rick. What's up? Was Dan Thomas's shoe store in next door? Next door. I'll show you a second. Well, I should. No, I take that back. Dan was everywhere. Yes. Okay. He was there. Well, he was there. Yeah. No, this is not that same building. No, pay attention, and I'll get to that. No. <laughs> yeah. See, that was around from about the O'Neill block's been around since about 1875 when he bought the property and started get, started transitioning it into the block of businesses and apartments till it burned. Okay. Now. All right, here's, this is a block as it looked in the 19, early 1900s. This is the building or, that, well, Dan was in this building, but where Dude lived was in this building. The next one over. The next one down, okay. Right beside the alley. Right beside it, yes. That's the one that I remember. Okay. I'm not as old as you, so I don't remember this one. <laughs> you still ask me questions. Well, I know, that's why I ask them. <laughs> There's another view of that looking up now. There was a sh this is looking west, and there was a shoe store. It wasn't Dan's at that time, and a bakery. Okay. But uh, I'll go a little farther along here. This was another. This is just another view of the building, which is and it was decorated. I think it was probably decorated maybe for Labor Day. I'm not sure, but that was. That one's got, you know, with the stores along, and then there was another little drop down here, but mm -hmm. this one here, and there's a, uh, there's another view of that, that one, Gert. Yeah. Okay, that was just a dance that he had a shoe store here, ah, uh, and uh, yeah, and that's where the, this is where the VFW was, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's an, here's a, whoop, what I do here. This is kind of this is the east end of the block around 1900. This is the side of the of the block today. You know where the bricks fell down? Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Okay, and that's the alley. So you just kind of look in at that. Uh, man, this one. This is the east end, east end of the O'Neill block, and. Uh, and tell me, see that, I've been told, I think that's Dewey Kemp's restaurant there. This is the alley again, next to the, the main block. And this was Dan's, this, Dan, this was Dan Thomas's store here. It has shoes repaired. And you can't read, right here, this says uh, D. Thomas, five and 10 cent store, is what that sign says. So Dan was in there, at the, uh, he was in there before it burned. So that was the, in, uh, What's this one for? Okay. This was the O'Neill. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, yes, my God, yes. That that sleigh, that's uh, that's George and Charlie Smith. So that was taken around 1928 or 29. This was just before it burned. I don't know what the goat's name was. What was the goat's name? What was the goat's name? I don't know. No. And I don't remember the goat. <laughs> Do you remember this lake? Yeah. And my, my father must have hooked the goat up and we got Charlie and I. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, it looks like I can blow it up. And that, the, the building had been, it had so many fires. It had like nine fires between 97 and 1927. And, and you'd read things where they, they believed it was, the building was fireproof and indestructible because it had so many fires that had been put out over the years. You know, they had some that were structures, some were just small fires, it was a chimney fire, and, but they just said, they said it'll never burn, and this is a copy of the fire report when it did burn, but it says on, on Sunday morning, December 15th, 1929, at 3 a.m., fire did break out, and the block's luck ran out when the block was destroyed. That's just a copy, copy of the fire report, and where it was retyped. You know, very stubborn. The fire had gained rapid headway and made a very hot and stubborn fire. The block was nearly a complete loss. Several of the tenants were insured and one or two were not. Forty-three men were present, helped in every way they could. It was about seven o'clock before it was under control. They didn't burn the building uh, no, no, not at that time. And tenants at the time of the fire were Kemp's Cafe, Dan's Five and Ten, and shoe shop, Joe Demers Bakery, Baldwin's Market, and Bishop's Dry Cleaner. The rooms on the second floor were living quarters with Dan's, Thomas's family, Fred Morrill, and Miss Lizzie Shedrick. And one of the newspaper reports reported that Mrs. Morrill, she had, she had to jump out the back window on a wood pile to escape. But what was really, really neat is these, guys, these people, when they had these fires, they didn't mess around. They just now, Joe Demur, a lot of you remember Joe, and as the block was still burning, Joe got in touch with Dan, W.F. Danforth and purchased the Danforth block on Main Street. This is Sunday morning now, which that's part of the, where the bakery is today. He also ordered some new modern machinery for use, and by Monday morning, he was rearranging the interior of the building, and he expected to have everything working within the next 10 days, which... Uh, they didn't. Uh, <laughs> they didn't have a they mess around too much. The this last land deal I have is a piece of land located just north of the Catholic Church that Patrick O'Neill leased to a Charles Goodrich in April of 1884 for a roller skating rink. And this is a copy of the lease. You can't. It, it gives it oh, gives the dimensions. And you know where it is in relation to uh, the church and everything else. And this was this was this was a map, a survey map of the school and the Baptist church. And this this roller skating rink, this Charles Goodrich put up a 40 by 100 foot building right here, just north of the old Catholic church, and right where the rectory is today. He built this. The, the roller skating rink, the Bristol Parlor roller rink, okay, yeah, and and it operated from. Uh, let me see, let me get over here. Eighteen eighty four. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. I lost my. Uh, lost my. I lost my cursor. Yeah, and. It was, it, uh, yeah, it lasted until 1885. What was kind of neat, some of the things that, that they had, they'd have, they had one other roller rink earlier down over the hill, but these were big. At one time they had 300 people there. They would hold, uh, the Lincoln Band played there. One week they had a, they had a one-legged skater. But they had a they had a fat man skating party in June of 1884. Sorry. I don't know they had a skinny man, but but then when it it, it burned and uh, I can't get that. That's more notes here, but oh, let me back up. Okay. Uh, anyways, they they reported that it, it was set. The, the, somebody burned it, but they said if it hadn't rained the night before, 
they figured that the uh, Catholic Church, the school, and the Baptist Church would have burned. Speculation or whatever. I guess that's all the property that I can confuse you on right now. All that. Is Sylvia still here? She just Oh, okay. Yeah, must be. <laughs> I don't know. I was wondering about that. It might be. But it was kind of neat uh, that they would do. Uh, because I had, I had come across that once before, that there was a roller skating rink in that around then, but I didn't know where it was until I, then I, I found where they talked about the church and stuff, and on the lease that it, Gave it, put it right down, and I could go from that uh, that old survey map where they had the pins on that map, and they described the same thing in the deed. They described those same markers, so you could you could all, you could take that map and measure it, and almost put it right where set it right where it belong where where it was. But, so, okay. it's yours. Yeah. tell you about the end of the Patrick O'Neill family farm. <laughs> You've heard from John about the genealogy of how the family started. Can you hear me? No. Okay. Is that microphone on? Oh, oh I see. All right. I do have to speak up. I will do my best. Uh, you've heard from John with an expert presentation about the genealogy of the O'Neill family in Bristol, and from Reg, well, he gave us a good rundown on all the buildings they owned and all the uh, different things they did with their money. So this time I'm here to bring, uh, it was quite an illustrious family, I think, at the time. I'm here to bring to close that accumulation of property, which would be just the farm. We were just in on the farm. The Coffin family were the only other owners of the O'Neill property to use it as a dairy farm. If it wasn't for Lester's great desire to own a farm, who wouldn't, <coughs> a farm, we wouldn't be there. We have been asked many times how we got there in the first place. Well, I'm sure some of you have heard this before, but if you wait a few minutes, I'll tell you again. <laughs> um, I think you all know who Lester is. He was my husband. And uh, he and I were born in Quincy, Massachusetts, eight miles south of Boston on the South Shore, right next to the Atlantic Ocean, and I went swimming in the ocean every day. So I missed the water when I came to Vermont. We, okay, we did not meet for about 20 years later. When he was in boot camp with the Marine Corps, his family had moved to Weehawken, New Jersey during World War II so that his father could work on the um, war effort. And he worked on ships that were in the New York Harbor, because Weehawken is right across from New York City. And he worked on the ships painting and refurbishing them during the war. Um, during that time, 
and a af uh, little after that time, the Agriculture Department set up a program to enlist high school uh, students to go to farms in New England, Vermont especially, to the farms where sons had been killed and workers and they were kind of depleted of, of staff on the farms. So um, he saw the poster and because he was living in the city, he decided he'd rather go to some other place for the summer. So he, he um, signed up to go and he was accepted and for, for um, the first, first um, well I should read this because I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, they started, uh, the Department of Agriculture just started to recruit young high school students to go to the needing farms for the summer. They would be paid a small fee and get their room and board for working, you know, every day of the week. As a teenager with not much to do in the city, he signed up. He was accepted and landed a job in Bridport, Vermont, on the Linus Payne farm, and that farm is still there on Route 22A. Mr. Payne confided in me once that he said to himself when he saw us to get off that train in Middlebury, what am I ever going to do with that boy? <laughs> well, he found out they got along very well, and uh, that's when Les started to really want to be a dairy farmer because he liked the discipline of the whole thing. So he went to um, work on that farm again for a couple of more summers, and then he graduated from Weehawken High School. And by the way, uh, Weehawken, New Jersey is where Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton had that wonderful duel and right at the end of his parents' street is the little park and the, uh, the sign that says all about the duel. Hamilton Avenue, they lived on Hamilton Avenue. <laughs> we are in New Jersey. Um, uh, boys weren't the only workers to come up from the cities. Girls could sign up too. And when we moved to Bristol, I got to meet two of them. One was Florence Grove, who lived near Weehawken, and she was assigned to the Shattuck farm in Moncton, and that is Florence Shattuck, and she married William, one of the boys of the family. Uh, Florence lives in Kansas City now <laughs> with her two daughters there. And the other girl was Diane Hansen, who we all know and love. She came from New York, to the then Parrington farm, and she married Frances Heffernan and stayed in our fair town. So we all know her. She came in the same program. Uh, Les went to Vermont Agriculture School when it was uh, the, uh, just for agriculture and because he wanted to know more about the business of farming. He knew about milking and the machinery and all that, but he wanted to know about business things. So he was there and then he went into the Marine Corps and then he had a time in Korea. Well, I met him before he went to Korea and we decided to marry when he came back. <sighs> Where did talk of being a farmer come in? Mm -hmm. City girl, not knowing anything about a farm. What did we talk about? Not much about farming, I will tell you. I just, <laughs> I just knew that if he wanted to do that, it was all right by me. But I was not thinking about moving to Vermont. He got out of the service in April of 1954 and looked for a farm job. And he found one right away at the Green Range Farm in Whiting. That was owned by Tom Whitaker. 
Tom was an auctioneer and in Brandon and was milking a new breed of cows called Polled Ashers. Not that I ever saw one. <laughs> I wasn't invited to the barn to see the Polled Ashers. Anyway, um, uh, Tom also uh, inaugurated a Polled Asher Association in Brandon. And his son told me that they finally moved it to the Midwest because pulled ashes didn't, didn't <laughs> do very well in New England. <laughs> uh, well, after our marriage in June of 1954, we came home from our honeymoon one day ahead of time so Les could get right into the farming business. Uh, the goal, our goal, was always to own our own farm. And after two years and twin babies later, we were offered the opportunity to rent a farm. A farmer friend of ours, Celie Reynolds Jr. from East Middlebury, who Les knew before when he was in Vermont. Some of you may know John Reynolds, and that's his son. Uh, this was his dad, and he gave us the opportunity to go into this farm. <laughs> He would own the, Seely would own the cattle and the farm machinery. We would do the work, and when the milk chicks came in on the 15th and the 30th, we would pay the rent and then divide up, and the other bills, and then divide up what was left, which wasn't <laughs> that great. But anyway, that's how it worked. Well, I have finally gotten to the point of no return. Les and Seely looked at the place. I was brought in to see the housing, and we decided that we, if we were ever going to get started in farming, we'd better take the offer. So on April 29, 1956, we moved our belongings to the O'Neill Farm on, on then North Street, Bristol. We lived beyond the village so it turned out to be an RFD box number, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, and it finally turned into Monkey Road. <laughs> Before we rented the farm, there was a number of other farmers who did also, and that's what uh, Mr. O'Neill was. He was the overseer of renting the farm out. Um, I can only go back and name three other families who rented for short periods or long periods of time. Joseph and Dorothy Brown, correct? He's my informer on this. Uh, Roger Jimmo. Uh, uh, he was there in the 30s, and Andrew and Doris Hill Jimmo in the 40s. And then the Clifford Orvis family was there uh, before, we, before we came into it. So those are three renters of the farm. And I'm sure that all the farmers that rented from them did their best to keep the land up and work, work the, the barn the way that it was. Um, well, Mr. Edward L. O'Neill was a gentleman farmer. He overseed the property. We never called him Ed. We always called him Mr. O'Neill out of respect for our elders, as we were taught when we were growing up. So that is why he is Mr. O'Neill in my piece. He was only at the Bristol farmhouse during the summer months and boarded up the doors of the main part of the house so the tenants had only the back L of the house. The kitchen was in the far end of the L, and fortunately there was a bathroom that functioned, except when the pipes froze. There was no cellar underneath the bathroom and no central heating. So after our daughter Nancy was born in November of 1957, Mr. O'Neill opened up another room for us to use, which became our dining room when we bought the house. The years went on with that arrangement, 
of shares. Then we were able to buy the cattle and machinery from Sealy and have only Mr. O'Neill involved with money. Well, <laughs> not that there was ever that much more money. The economy for farmers in the 50s left something to be desired. From time to time, we approached Mr. O'Neill about buying the farm. He knew that that was our goal, but always held off because he wanted one of his sons to have the property, to keep it in the family. He had three sons, Bernard, Edward Jr., and William, who showed no interest in the place. They were off in the corporate world, but they must have visited their father when he was in Montpelier for the fall and winter. Son William uh, Bill lived in Bristol. After seven years, we decided to look for another place. Although we liked Bristol, the children were in school here and it would be hard to start over some, in some other place. With the prospect of our leaving, he finally decided to sell the farm to us. So on the fifth day of January, 1963, Mr. Edward L. O'Neill personally appeared and acknowledged the deed and gave up the property his family had owned for so many years. I am sure that was a disappointment to him and we hardly ever saw him again before he died in Burlington in 1972. After the property was ours, we opened up the whole house and started a renovation. In order to get a FHA loan, and that's the Farmers Home Administration, we had to agree to put in central heating in the whole house. Didn't have any. Uh, we had to paint the house and replace windows and storm doors. That was a tall order for a couple without funds saved to do this kind of renovation. However, over the next few years, we were able to do these required improvements and renovate the whole house inside, mainly through Lester's will to make a home out of an old, old house. I have a few pictures. Um, unfortunately, there's no, there are no dates on these pictures that were given to us. But these are how the farm looked at different periods. Oh, we have it up there already. Look at that nice fencing around the property. And the porch was extensive and very lovely to look at. So I'm sure they sat out there, although I don't see any chairs out there. Well, maybe there's one. <laughs> maybe there's one over there to the to the right, but that looked like a very nice gentle house, didn't it? And, uh, and I think maybe you can see uh, tracks in the dirt driveway. Uh, maybe there was a carriage and the horses, hooves are uh, in, front of, in front of it there. So it was a, a very nice appearance there. And then we have the, sh uh, Next one, a shot of the house from the west side. And you can see that now that there's part of a porch and then a screened in porch and then a gazebo in the back. And there it looks like there was some uh, work being done on a barn right, or uh, building right next to the house. Also, um, you, um, this is this is where we lived in this end of the house. Uh, that we did have this room right here, right there, and the porch, and then this was the L of the house in the back, and the kitchen was way down at the other end. So that's what we came on to, and it looks like there's no shutters on the uh, top floor windows of the house at that time. 
So the gazebo we took down after we we had the house and uh, in the um, historic architecture of Addison County, which is this authority um, that they did, uh, it tells that the house was built circa 18, let's see, um, 1805, a federal style Georgian plan. There was a shed that was built in circa 1880 a smokehouse, a small brick smokehouse that was brick and then not very good repair. How about that, Jerry? <laughs> and uh, that was born, um, it was born in 1860, <laughs> built. Um, the granary was built in 1880 and the barn was 1860. So we have some pretty old buildings there. The feature that they picked up on the barn was the big transom. I don't think we have a picture of that, do we? No, 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 uh, no, none of the, well, yes, the transom would have been at the end of the barn. I guess you can just see it's a different color from the barn uh, and it was very heavy very, very heavy, and lots of pulleys to get it down, and that was the hay mow uh, uh, there to put the bales of hay in. We could also come in from, from the front of the barn too, so we didn't always have to put, but that gave a little bit of air in the barn too for the bales. All right. Um, we did the, yeah, okay. And then the next one is um, uh, the broad photo of the farm. Yeah, yeah. And this one was done in 1940. And we know that because it says so. <laughs> and I have the picture um, that you could look at. Uh, it's a little lighter than than the one when it was transformed. Oh yes, you can see the transom now on the end of the barn. You see the square, square with the... It's white. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and the silos there now, and uh, you can see Bristol Pond uh, to the north. Um, Yes, there was 22 and a half acres of land along the Bristol Pond. And when the state decided that they would raise the level of the pond to make it a Lake Winona, um, they flooded over that acreage and it killed all the vegetation there and the cedar trees that we use for fencing. Mm -hmm. So eventually we sold it back to the state and because it wasn't useful to us anymore, I think we got $2,000 for it. But <laughs> anyway, that was part of the acreage that we had bought. And I know that Vermont Bicycle Touring had that circa 1940 picture in, in one of your offices too, because I saw it in yeah. Well, the economics of farming left some much to be desired in the 1950s and 60s, and as much as they are today, for all the 24-7 that's put into dairy and the dairy and raising the feed for the herd, which is never compensated uh, for the toil. We decided to sell the herd in 1965 and find a different life path. We had an auction and sold the herd, but Les did not sell the machinery. 
Uh, so I should have seen the handwriting on the wall because after about two years, less than two years, he bought another herd. <laughs> <laughs> well, he missed the independence of the farming. He worked for other people, got along all right, but he, he liked to be his own boss. So he bought the herd and it didn't take long to see that the economics of it was not gonna be any better than it was two years previously. So we decided to tell, sell everything this time. The last photo I threw in, uh, oh, good, with the house in the background, and that is what we did after we retired from farming. Um, let's see, that was taken after we opened the campground and the swimming area, four and a half acre pond that we built for public swimming. And children um, in Bristol learn how to swim there. We were very happy about that. It was before Mount Abe's pool and their swimming program. So uh, we we sold season passes, and a lot of families um, bought them because numerous children were involved. And one of my sweetest memories of the whole thing was. The Westons, you know, the Weston family with those children. Well, Vivian would bring them down and they all knew how to swim, so she didn't have to watch them anymore. So she would just swim out to the middle and lay back and float with her arms behind her head and had a little siesta. <laughs> no responsibilities out in the middle of the pond. So she's, she was a wonderful mother. She is a wonderful mother still. Uh, we had quite a few families that bought season passes, so a lot of children were there. Um, let's see. The cattle and the... Oh, the... We, we did sell the cattle and machinery finally in June of 1968 and uh, less retired from farming. So we had this recreation business with the camping too. Remember there was camping that was part of it and for approximately 10 years. And then we decided to really retire in the early 90s. Our son David and daughter Nancy are pictured in here, along with two young nephews who were visiting from New Jersey. They loved the farm, but their parents didn't. So they never stayed very long. Oh, I have three other colored pictures of the farm area. Two were taken from the air, from a from planes and uh, and after uh, let's see that would be the two uh, this would be the one from the plane and the other two were in photographs uh, professional photograph photographers and you can see how uh, the uh, the setup was at the at those times when those pictures were taken this is the late the latest one that was. 2002, I think, but that's that's the brick house across the road, and there's Burpee Road and and the land behind behind over next to Burpees. Uh, let's see. Uh, I also have a copy. Oh, it's under your machine. Yeah. I also have a copy when we bought the place the lawyer had to do <laughs> had to do his work to find out who owned the farm <laughs> all the properties that O'Neill and that's what what John did too. I mean he had to go back and back and back. This was quite a bit of work for him. And we paid for it, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, we paid for it. Um, well, eventually the house had become too big for us. 
The children married and were living their own lives and grandchildren were coming. We were very fortunate to have one August Sunday, two bikers driving by, out, well, driving their bicycles by, and saw the for sale sign out in front of, of the house. We had just put it out, too. Where's Jerry? Yeah. It was Jerry Slager and John Frieden who had started um, a new business Vermont Bicycle Touring. This is the 1981 catalog from that business. And he just stopped and they turned, I saw them, I was upstairs in my bedroom cleaning and I looked out and here's these two fellows on bicycles stopping right in front of the house and backing up and going down the driveway. <laughs> I said, oh boy, I wonder what they want. <laughs> so anyway, John looked at the barn he, he looked at the barn more than they looked in the house. I don't think they went in the house that time. But he was figuring out what he could do with that barn to store his bicycles. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, um, he did buy the house and the barn, 10 acres, in October of 1980. And therein is the end of the O'Neill Farm, O'Neill and Coffin Farm. So anyway, uh, uh, the house, um, hmm, let's see, where are we here? Uh, by January 1st, 1981, we had built a new house across the road on pasture land on the hill and Vermont Bicycle Touring was ready to move into their new property, having purchased it in October of 1980. So we looked over at a quiet business growing in the house that quickly became offices, and the barn was restructured inside to become the grand storage building for the bikes for the trips. We sold the pond, uh, with uh, within 20 acres to Peter and Bunny Dobner, and then we, because we wanted the farmland to be still used as farmland and not development, we sold that property to uh, Robert Hill, the Four Hills Farm, Four Hills Farm. So that was an interesting time for us. So Lester lived, for the years that Lester lived in the Rick House across the road, he could look over on the fruits of his labors, a good steward of the land and always his desire to keep it as natural and close to the Vermont traditions of a farm. I'm not sure what the outcome of the house and property will be now that uh, Vermont Bicycle Touring has moved out of the house. Their offices have gone to Williston. But the bikes are still in the barn. So there is a little activity over there. They have two nice shops for people to work in to put the bikes together and all. And this was, as I say, this was 1981. This was a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. That was uh, f after 40 years. And 2016 is this big. They go all over the world with their bike tours. And we just felt very fortunate to have them across the road from us. I'll let you look at them if you want to. But it, um, I'm almost through. <laughs> Uh, hmm. Well, it's quiet over there. No cars coming and going anymore. It's, it's just quiet. I need to express gratitude for the plus side of moving to Bristol. I've talked about the economics that haven't been good, but that wasn't Bristol's fault. That was the Department of Agriculture, mostly. Uh, over the years, 
we have come to know a tremendous number of friendly, loving people who have become best friends for all these years. These good souls far outweigh the economics of farming, and our joy is in the children, their spouses, four grandchildren, six great-grandchildren. Our family planted a young maple tree out near the barn in Lester's honor. He always said to just scatter his ashes on some old manure pile. So we got him as close to the barn as we could and with a tree as there was no manure pile left. So ends my history of living on the O'Neill farm a city girl who had never been on a farm or seen barn animals until someone brought her to this beautiful part of our country. I've lived in Bristol 60 years now. Am I a Vermonter yet? <laughs> That's it, thank you. Yeah, I might add one other motivation for Lester renovating the house was the legend that in the walls was buried a bag of diamonds. Oh, yeah. that's <laughs> so right. Someone, I forgot if Lester that. found them, he's not talking. Every, <laughs> every room, he, he stripped it right down to nothing and insulated yeah, everything. They so. uh, yeah. yeah. found yeah. He didn't find them in the barn either, did you? We never did. No. <laughs> Um, so that's it. Thank you.